Good morning and welcome to worship. It's good to be in this place and for those of you that are worshipping at home or in the company of others, welcome. It's good to have you at St David's this morning as well. I begin with something that is very clearly a pretend story. The lion was proud of his mastery of the animal kingdom. One day he decided that he needed to make sure that the other animals knew that he was the king of the jungle. And he was so confident that he bypassed all of the smaller animals and went straight to the bear. Who is the king of the jungle, the lion asked. And the bear replied, why you are, of course. The lion gave a mighty roar of approval. And next he asked the tiger, who is the king of the jungle? And the tiger quickly responded, everyone knows that you are a mighty lion. Next on the list was the elephant. And the lion faced the elephant and addressed his question, who is the king of the jungle? And the elephant immediately grabbed the lion with his trunk, whirled him around the air five or six times and slammed him into a tree. And then he pounded him onto the ground several times, dunked him under the water in a nearby lake and finally dumped him out onto the shore. And the lion, beaten, bruised and battered, struggled to his feet. He looked at the ele elephant through sad and bloodied eyes and said, look, just because you didn't know the answer didn't mean you had to be mean about it. <laughs> well, in our gospel reading this morning, Jesus once again tells his disciples about his impending suffering and death. But almost in the next breath, when his disciples had time to themselves on the road, they began arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. When Jesus asked them what it was that they were talking about, they couldn't find it in themselves to give him an answer. How unlike our own is Christ's wisdom? Whoever wants to be first must be last. Whoever wants to be first must be the servant of all. Let's pray. Lord God, you are wonderful. You are more glorious than any telescope or microscope can ever disclose more beautiful than an artist's brush or a poet's pen can ever portray, more loving than any love song or anthem could ever extol, we take this moment and worship you. As we seek your face and favor this morning, help us to open up our hearts and lives to you afresh. Lord God, this world offers many wide avenues and beautiful boulevards on which to walk, but you invite us to walk the road of service and sacrifice. This morning, as we come into this place and ask in this time of worship, we ask you to look both at our lives and at the ministry and mission of the congregation. And as you do, we pray that you might form our hearts, calibrate our vision that we might be your servants and witnesses. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing an old loved hymn, You Servants of God. Your master proclaim.
please be seated. We come now to a time of prayer again, this time a prayer of confession of sins. Let's pray. Most merciful God, in the quietness of this place, hear our silent confession of sin, hear our prayer. Lord God, while we try and live your way so often, we just follow our own desires. We confess how much we are like those first disciples of Jesus. We just don't get it. We boast of great wisdom, but fail to understand or even seek to understand your ways. We do not plant ourselves in your hope and your grace. And so we reap harvests of disorder and conflict. Draw near to us, gracious God, and forgive us. Draw us into your tender arms and teach us peace and gentleness, the willingness to put others first, the wisdom to serve instead of seize, all so that we might bring forth a harvest of righteousness and peace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this is the wisdom and the mercy of God. Romans asks, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We're going to welcome our choir now. They're singing a David McGregor song.
Well, the weekly notices have been sent out to you as per normal, and I commend them to your reading. Special thanks to Pam, not only for being the, the choir director, uh, but also in her support of Joe, because at the moment, if you have notices, they go to Pam. Uh, Joe is working many more hours at the moment, so Pam has stepped up in preparing that resource for us. So let's now come before God and thank him for his goodness as we pray for our offering. Please can we stand as we pray together and then remain standing for the next couple of things. Loving God, thank you that you always put others first. Thank you that you have the heart of a servant and help us as a church to serve you and others and help us to use these tithes and offerings to the extension of your kingdom here and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Will you extend that peace right where you are to others? We had the same Bible reading that we do today. My son John, his wife Liz and their little girl Brooke were at church with us. Grandad was looking after Brooke and I went out the front for children's time. I was sitting on the steps talking to the children and I asked them, who is the most important person in Australia? 
By this time, Brooke had escaped from Grandad and ran forward shouting, Nana! <laughs> what a great answer to my question. Am I the most important in a person in Australia? Of course not. Am I an important person in her life? I hope so. There are lots of important people in our lives, our mums and dads, our family, our teachers and our friends. We don't have to put them in order. We don't have to choose who is the most important. Jesus' disciples were talking about who was the greatest in their group, who was the most important. But when Jesus asked them what they were talking about, they didn't want to answer. Perhaps they were a bit embarrassed. Do you know what he told them? If you want to be first, you must put yourself last and be the servant of all. This sounds a bit odd, but Jesus often turned things upside down. He wanted his disciples and us to know that when we care for others, when we put their needs before our own, we're living the way God wants us to. When I was little, we sang a song that was called Joy. Jesus and others and you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus and others and you. In the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus because he takes first place. O is for others. We meet face to face. Y is for you in all that you do. Put yourself last and spell joy. God bless you all. Our reading this morning is from Mark, reading from chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. Leaving that region, they travelled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying, however, and they were afraid to ask him what he meant. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer him because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. He sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Then he put a little child among them Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. And this is the word of our Lord. Advertisers know how to select just the right slogan to create the image that they want to sell. Old Spice was for some years the mark of a man. Picture a bronzed surfboard rider riding a perfect tube wave. And on the beach there's a lovely girl wearing a bikini. And as he approaches the shore, she begins to sit up and turn around and the only spoken words come come via the the announcer's voiceover the power of old spice know it feel it sense it the power of old spice the mark of a man well i had a look at that ad this i would have shown it to you but it looks quite old anyhow but there's a lot of illusion happening there in that ad. Could the girl have smelled aftershave on the man in the surf? Would his aftershave and its aroma even stay in place 
among the monster waves? Was he feeling the power? Was she sensing it? It's all a bit far-fetched, really, but they've spelled out the one line they want you to take on board. The mark of a real man is that he uses old spice. Well, another website in the day told me that prolonged use could make your neck turn green. But the makers of Old Spice hoped you wouldn't see that one. Just what the mark of a man is, is also what's being discussed in today's Gospel reading. Not in the same way, to be sure, but it's there in the small print. First, in the description of, of what is before Jesus in his life's journey, and later, what their mark should be. Well, Jesus, once again, has made an effort to avoid crowds. He wants to spend time with his disciples and time by himself. And he begins to tell them what the mark or the essence of his calling is in real terms. And he tells them the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. And they will kill him. And three days later, after being killed, he will rise again. But they didn't understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Now, I hope we never fall into the trap of thinking that the disciples were stupid or slow. Jesus had so often spoken to them in parables that he needed to explain later on. And even in this declaration, it would have been reasonable to wonder if what was he was saying was code for something that he considered that they should understand. The Son of Man, what, was he speaking of himself? Was it a reference to a Hebrew scripture, an Old Testament scripture that used that phrase? And if so, well then the next Few words were a puzzle. And in three days he will rise. What might that have been code for? Though most Jews considered that God would raise the dead bodily at the end of the age, what might this have meant? This didn't sound like any part of the gameplay of God that they understood or had heard explained. So instead of coming across as thick-skulled again, they opted not to ask for an explanation. Now Jesus at this point, I assume, trailed off, leaving the disciples to their own discussion. And they too began a conversation, almost a contest, about who most closely held the attributes of the mark of a man. Did this come up to fill the void of what they hadn't understood? Was it avoidance, either of asking Jesus to clarify what he meant or, or even just ducking what felt to them like a tense or morbid subject? Or was it, as some Christians have suggested might have been the case, that if Jesus was to be taken out of the picture, even for two or three days, who among them might fill his leadership spot. It certainly sounds possible. Perhaps Judas, as the treasurer, might have put the case that he naturally would have been next in line. In our place and time, we might be cheeky and call that the Josh Frydenberg syndrome. Or in our current parliament, Peter Dutton might have been in there somewhere as well. James, John, and Peter were, had all been taken on special excursions with just Jesus, and maybe it would be one of them. Alternatively, perhaps it was the disciple who, when the three of those went away, that the other disciples turned to when they were up the mountain or, or seeing Jesus do what he did with Jairus' daughter. What is made clear is that when they get back to the place where they're staying and Jesus asks what they've been talking about on the road, 
there was a room full of silent men with decidedly downcast eyes. And the gospel writer explains to us what it is that they've been arguing about. Who was it that was greatest among them? Darn, how did he always seem to know? In the shadow of the unthinkable, perhaps it was easy for the disciples to find bravado, especially if he was out of earshot. And I wonder whether there is pause for us here as well. Certainly these are some of the thoughts that have stuck with me through this week. And it's a little bit different. I'm changing the slant a little bit, so try and stay with me if you can. Are there ever times when we think we're up to being the head of a church? Do I ever feel myself capable of that? Now, these might be curious questions, but let me explain what I mean, because Jesus often orchestrated things that would turn things a bit upside down. So the disciples seem to be arguing among themselves who could step into Jesus' shoes. Who among us could do that? Not me. And yet we're hearing and reflecting on this story and we're seeing what the disciples did not see and we're knowing what the disciples could not at that stage know. Jesus was betrayed into human hands, killed and then raised from the dead on the third day. And remarkably, here's the thing, remarkably, Jesus did have a plan for succession. God's plan, his only plan of succession, is that generation after generation of exceedingly, inarguably flawed human beings take the role in God's world of being what he terms the body of Christ. Moments of ego and bravado aside, are you up for that? Am I? I can only speak for myself, but I'd have to say, not alone I can't. I'm both comforted and reminded of the reality that the psalmist very clearly understood when he wrote the words, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. There's only one way, I think, that you and I could do that job, the job that God asks of his church, and that's to be the hod carriers and Bricky's laborers or at least the foreman who follow a blueprint made by someone else who's wiser than ourselves. In other words, the only way we could do the job God asks of his church is to take the attitude of a servant. Now, everything that Jesus says in this passage flips what is commonly thought right on its head. Heather said that in the children's address. It's true. God's divine plan for Jesus' life entailed death. Human strength and bravado is best replaced with weakness. Status is best seen in the framework of those who are seeking no status at all. And Jesus took in his arms a little child. Now, we hear this in very Western 2021 contexts. Let me dispel some of that. First of all, he wasn't reminding us that the passing on of the gospel needs to include children, although that is true. And it lines up with what our church council is considering in its plans for family ministry through Messy Church. But he wasn't also saying, in this context at least, that we needed to have the trusting faith of a child. He was saying that what God respects is a person who welcomes even a child. 
Again, we have to take off our 2021 Western ears to fully understand that. Because there was a very definite pecking order in Middle Eastern society. I think there still is. And I think that that concept really isn't only restricted to the Middle East. There are, there are in our own cultures, distinct lines of respect if you had a lot of money and you decided you were going to throw a party and you invited the A-listers, I don't even know who they are, that would be including society of its highest order. So we kind of get the idea there. Well, in Jesus' time, to speak of welcoming children, to show them honor or hospitality reversed the expected pecking order indeed. Children were the most vulnerable members of society. Children were powerless in their day. They didn't contribute to the well-being of the family, and that was a deal. They didn't work in the fields, and therefore they didn't count. Jesus, in Jesus' day, children, much like women, lacked status and power. And to broaden your understanding of this just a little bit more, I should tell you that infant mortality rates sometimes reached 30%. Put that aside, because I'm going to give you another little bit of maths. You'll be fine. Of live births, 30% of those babies would be dead by the time they were six years old, 30%. And 60% of them would have been gone by the age of 16. Do the maths, and you'll find that only 10% of pregnancies that went to term resulted in children who lived to adulthood. Children were always the first to suffer from famine, war, disease, dislocation, and in some areas or eras, Few would have lived to adulthood with both living parents. Children had little status in the community or even the family. The family considered them, while they were minors, that they were on par with a slave, only one that didn't really do anything. And only after reaching maturity was a child seen to be a free person who could inherit the family estate. So Jesus was saying that they were not only to welcome those with such status, but that they should be, expect also to be welcomed and most valued as servants, to lead, to be the first among others must be exercised by being last of all. And when we embrace that value system, we show hospitality not only to Christ, but also to the one who sent him. I hope that over time, you'll come to increasingly recognize that when the scriptures speak of things that challenge the way our world thinks about things, they do so not only to give us something to think about, but rather to encourage us to transform our own lives. How might we be servants to those that we meet? How might we, even in the business decisions we make day to day, reflect the attitudes of finding strength in selflessness with those that we meet? How might we act in our daily lives with actions and attitudes that reject power for power's sake and build up another person. This is what Jesus says is the mark of a man or a woman or a child of God in his eyes. My lovely dad had a few favorite sayings and this one came to mind this week. He used to say, there's really only one job available where you start at the top, and that's digging holes. <laughs> and I'll add, and that's a servant's job. 
Let's pray. Lord God, nev let it never be that we listen and reflect on scripture only to file it away as head knowledge. This text places a huge call in our lives as a church and as individuals. Show us how to embody the call you place on us and enable us to be different. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song fits. We're going to stand and we're going to sing the servant song. From heaven you came. come now to a time of prayer once again this time a prayer for ourselves and others Lord we pray for those in our world seeking validation that word in itself is evocative as though any human life should ever be considered invalid or invalid We pray for those who feel invalidated by things beyond their control. For those in some 
areas who've been locked down now for, for 90 days because they live in a particularly affected postcode. More generally, for the helpless in aged care establishments where care is actually thin on the ground. For abandoned spouses who've been traded in for a newer model. For kids who feel unloved and unwanted. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those weakened by illness and anxiety who feel that they're traveling a fearful and weary road for those who fight voices in their minds that say that they are not enough and bow to lies that tell them that they'll never really measure up. The truth is that we are loved even when our feelings are set asunder in the stress of it all. Lord God, you say, we are strong when we think we are weak. You say we are held even when we feel we, are, we have fallen short. And when we feel we don't belong, this is the most wonderful thing of all. You say we are yours. And as we pause in the quiet space for a moment, help that to wash through our spirits. Lord, in this quiet place, hear the congregation as they pray in silence for some of the things that have been in our newspapers this week. Voluntary assisted dying legislation. Nuclear submarines and the reactions from Europe and China. those who are sick with COVID and those who are rebelling, demanding their freedoms. Lord, we've prayed this way to ask that you might continue to help us to walk with you through the real things that happen in our lives, in our nation, and in our world, that as we walk with you, we might be in that place of prayer, speaking at times, listening often, and being formed by your kingdom response. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray together the words Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our next song is a listening song. If you know it, jump in, but... What joy is found in communion with you? is great. 
place that draws us near. How amazing is his love unfailing. Well, now it's time to leave worship in this context, but we take that relationship with God into the world. And so our benediction words this morning go out into the world in the power of the Spirit. In all things and at all times, remember that Christ is with you. Make your life your worship to the praise and glory of God. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with you now and evermore. Amen.